May God's grace, mercy, and peace be upon each of you now and always. Amen. Jonah went. Jonah went this time. He didn't argue. He didn't complain. When the word of the Lord called Jonah, he left. He got up, and as soon as he was spit out on the shore by the great fish, he went. He went to the people of Nineveh, and he immediately preached the sermon of his life. Or rather, as he probably saw it, the sermon of his death. He certainly didn't expect what happened. We're not given his whole sermon by scripture. We're only given eight words of the sermon. But those eight words were enough to impact all of Nineveh, to impact the people of Assyria. Here they heard those words, 40 days. And if you do not repent, you will be destroyed. I'm paraphrasing a little bit there, but you have it before you. And as you look and see, 40 days, they were afraid. And so from the peasant, the lowest of the low, to the highest of the high, the king, they called a time of repentance. They called the people to take off their regular clothes, their regular robes, and to put on sackcloth, to cover their heads with ashes, to fast. And not only the people, but did you notice, even the animals as well. Can you imagine this? Can you, can you imagine the people of Nineveh, this great city? And not just great in stature, because while it was three days in breath to travel across, it was also known as a great co- center of commerce at that time. The the city of Nineveh was known among all of Assyria and all the known world as a place where people could go for trading, for settling business accounts. This was a great place that had been called to repent. Turn back from your evil. Turn back from your violence. Turn back from your sin. Can you imagine this? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe instead imagine, instead of the name Nineveh, replace that name Nineveh with the word America, the name America. Instead of being called a city to repent, instead, imagining, imagine a country called to repent. Instead of three days to travel across the entire city, imagine three seconds for a message to go out across the Internet, not only to touch every corner of our country, but every corner of the globe. Imagine that same message being preached. Repent, or in 40 days you will be destroyed. It seems almost unimaginable in our own country, doesn't it? It seems almost incomprehensible to imagine a message like that having the same type of effect as it did on the people of of Nineveh. Here the people immediately, they fell to their knees. They got down and they prayed. But when we look at our country today, it's nearly unimaginable, almost incomprehensible to think that our nation would get down on their knees when called to repentance and seek God's repentance. I submit that perhaps the reason for this is because they don't know the Lord. Sure, they see glimpses of Him in nature. They see glimpses of His power all around them. But they don't know Him. Millions of people maybe have heard of Him. Millions of people probably have the internet and are able to find information about Him. They have Bibles that have been passed on to Him. They have people, churches on every corner. But there still are millions of people out there who don't know the Lord. We know that the only way you can truly know God is to actually know Him through Scripture, to know Him through His Word. And when we say His Word, we know that there's a dual meaning there, don't we? Because to know God through His Word is to know Him through His Son. We know the Lord through Christ Jesus, His Son, who, as John says, is the Word who is made flesh. The Word made flesh who dwelt among us. But if you don't know God through Scripture, through a personal relationship with Him, And do you truly know him? Do you truly know the God of the universe who spoke creation into existence and with just the same power could immediately vanquish it? No, we look at it and we say, we look around and we see people who don't know him. We know that they don't know. We know that there are people who, they've replaced God in their lives and in this world with gods they've concocted in their minds. Gods who are a little more easygoing. Because we know that when we face our God, when we truly face God and look upon Him, we know that He is a holy and He is a righteous God. That He is a just God. And that He expects nothing less of His people. We know that when we look upon Him, our sins are not hidden. They are laid bare before Him. When we look upon God, He sees down to our very center of our heart. He sees the sins that we've buried, the sins we've tried to hide, The sins that we would never tell to our closest, deepest friend or family member. And that's a scary prospect. 
And so we've replaced God. Our world has replaced God with God with a God who is a little more easygoing. A God who, rather than is watching us constantly, is constantly involved in our life, rather is sitting on the couch eating pretzels and watching football. A God who's out to lunch and on vacation unless we need him. And then, when we're in a sticky jam, he'll come help us out. A God who, rather than demanding perfection, kind of looks at us and says, it's all right, pats us on the shoulder and says, go along now. You'll do better next time. But that's not the God of Scripture, is it? That's not who God says He is. That's not what it means to worship a perfect God, a righteous God and a just God. And while those ideas of God may seem more comfortable and easier to deal with, that is not who God is. Our God is a God who is black and He is white. Either you're sinful or you're not. Either you've broken His law or you haven't. There's no wiggle room, is there? There's no space that we can fudge a little bit. Either we're sinful people or we're not sinful people. And Scripture goes a step further and tells us that God hates sin. God hates sin in our lives. He hates the sin in our world today. He hates that which our world calls good. He hates greed and corruption, which seems to be to rule in our nation and in around the country and around our world. He hates abortion, the killing of the unborn. He hates homosexuality. He hates living together outside of marriage. He hates all the things that our country applauds as good things because he calls those sin. Notice I did not say he hates those people, but he hates their sinfulness because he has called us to be like him. He has called us to be righteous and to be perfect, to be just. He has called us to be pure and to be holy just as he is. And so when we look and we see and we stand before our Lord, we realize that we are tainted by the sinfulness in our own lives. We are tainted by the sin in the world that has affected us and it has affected those around us. We know that even as we go to church, join together as fellow Christian believers, that we are still sinful people. And our God, He still hates our sin as well. What are we to do? What can we do? How can we respond to this knowing that our God hates our sin? And our sin, it is deserving of death. Many people ignore this. They, they try to weasel out of it. But sin, sin is a one-way ticket. Sin leads to death. And sin, apart from God, leads to death, eternal death in hell. And so what are we to do? The people of Nineveh, they repented. The people of Nineveh, they came before God. They changed their pattern of sinfulness. The people of Nineveh, they stripped down from their robes those comfortable robes they had and replaced them with sackcloth, admitting that they were sinners. They smeared ash across their foreheads knowing that they were not holy, but they were filthy. They declared a fast and said that no one would eat for three days and three nights, that no one would drink for three days and three nights, not only the people but the animals. The king saw this as he made that proclamation. He saw that necessity for repentance. And he called, as Jonah called the people to repentance, he called his people to repentance. And look at how God looked upon them. He looked upon them with compassion. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, He had compassion. And He, and he did not bring upon them the destruction that He had threatened. When the people of Nineveh sought His mercy, when the people of Nineveh sought His forgiveness, God gave them that forgiveness. Not because they deserved it. Not because of how well they had groveled or the fact they fasted but because they turned from their evil ways. They turned from their wickedness. And so God, He turned from His destruction. Now the ESV, the, the translation we were reading earlier, when it says God turned from His anger, from His destruction, they used the word relented. But the word there in Hebrew is nakam, and a much better translation actually the King James uses. And they use the word repent. God repented of His anger. 
Not in the sense that God was sorry that he was angry because his anger was righteous. Not in the sense that God had sinned in some way, but in the sense that God made a 180 degree to turn. 180 degree, degree turn from his anger, from his wrath. 180 degree turn to compassion and to mercy. That is who our God is. And what amazing picture of his grace we see there. Now that word grace, that word grace has a lot packed into it, doesn't it? Because that word grace is one we throw around a lot in the church. But to truly understand what we're talking about here is we understand that it is without our works, without what we have done. It is God's forgiveness, his mercy, not for what we have done to deserve it. And this is contrary to what the world says. Because the world says that if we want God's grace, if we want to live in God's favor, then we need to lead a nice and good life. We need to stay, that we need to be the nice person. Or at the very least, when we mess up, we really need to have a broken heart. We truly need to grovel. We got, we got to cry our eyes out. But no amount of tears, no amount of groveling, no amount of niceness, or even a list of good works could ever have the chance of saving us. God's plan for salvation. He had put it into effect long before the people of Nineveh. God's plan for salvation, he had put it into effect long before Adam and Eve even sinned, if you can believe that. Because as Paul says in Ephesians chapter 1, before the foundation of this earth, God already had put into effect his plan of salvation through his son Jesus Christ, our Lord. Before the foundation of this earth, God already had a plan for each of our lives, a plan of salvation. In fact, Paul says the word predestined. He elected each one of us for salvation. Now, sadly, in this world today, we see people who reject that salvation. We see people who reject the forgiveness that comes through our Lord. But God, he has given us that promise. And that is the same promise that was fulfilled for the people of Nineveh. Now, they may not have said Christ, but they knew that word Messiah the anointed one, the promised one, the promised one who is Jesus Christ, our Lord. He paid for the sins of Nineveh on the cross. Out of his great compassion, he took God's destruction. Out of his love, he took God's wrath and anger so that instead God might look on the people of Nineveh with mercy, with grace, and with forgiveness. And he looks upon us with that same mercy, grace, and forgiveness. Because we know that we are sinful people. We are people who know that when we take a true look at our lives, that even the excuses we make and the things that we, even when we try to fake it, that we are still sinners, that we are still people who have been broken, that we are still people who are tainted by the sin in this world, and we are people in need of forgiveness. And so Christ, when he went to the cross, he paid for the sins of Nineveh, but he paid for our sins as well. Yours and mine. When he went to the cross, he paid the price that could not be paid, except by his own shedding of his blood. When he went to the cross, he took God's righteous anger instead of us experiencing. He took God's, he instead was forsaken by God so that we might be accepted by God. He instead was destroyed so that we might live. What a beautiful, amazing promise of forgiveness that we have been given through our God. Not for what we have done. Not because of what we deserve, but because of His compassion. He has forgiven us and He has set us free. He has set us free to live as His people. People of the Gospel. People who have been set free to live lives not bound and, and, and torn down by sin, but people raised up and lifted up by His Spirit in our hearts. People who are no longer guilty, but who have been declared not guilty. People who have a message of hope in a world that is full of sinners. It's hard to imagine, isn't it? It's hard to imagine that if we, that if we declared what was right, if we called the world to repentance, that they would respond. It's hard to imagine that if we did in our country, our our states, our counties, or even our cities. But the Lord has given us the promise. He has given us the promise that if we repent, if we come to him and we humble ourselves, he will heal us. He will make us whole again and he will make us right. If we come before him in prayer, if we come before him on our hands and knees, he will hear our prayers and he will forgive us. 
He has declared us to be perfect, not by our works, not by what we have done or what we deserve, but because of His great love. And while the world may not know the power of God, they also don't know the mercy of God. They don't know the beautiful promise of salvation, and that is a promise they need to hear. That is a promise that every person needs to know. That promise that Jesus died on the cross for them, for you, for me, for all of us. That is a promise that can bring true healing to a world that has been destroyed by sin. And not only a promise for healing in our hearts, but a healing for our nation. Millennia ago already, the Lord made this promise. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, and will forgive their sins, and will heal their land. The Lord has given us that promise. That promise of healing for us. That promise of healing for our nation. That promise of healing for our world. And that is the promise that we can, we will be healed. That one day we will experience true healing. That one day we will be called home and we will no longer experience the pain and difficulties of this world. But that healing is also meant for right now. That healing is meant for each and every one of the people of this country and of this world. And that healing, that healing is intended to be proclaimed. Jonah, he messed up pretty bad, didn't he? He turned his back on God and he tried to run. But he sought the Lord's forgiveness and the Lord healed him. The Lord strengthened him and the Lord sent him. The Lord sent him to Nineveh with that message. And whether or not he expected it, the Holy Spirit worked in the hearts of those people of Nineveh. And he changed those hearts. He changed those wicked hearts and made them whole again. We should not expect anything less. The Lord has called us. He has healed us. And he has sent us. He has sent us to go out to heal our world. To heal our nation. And by the Holy Spirit, he will. There's no doubt, and there should be no doubt in our hearts. Because when our Lord, when He desires something, He will do it. May God's healing fall upon each one of us now. And may it overflow and flood our nation. That our nation may know the healing of God's forgiveness. That they may come to repentance and know that God has predestined, He has elected all people to be saved. Amen. Please pray with me. Gracious Lord, we live in a world that is full of turbulent times. A world that has been conquered, it seems, by sin. A world that seems as though it's incomprehensible to even imagine your word going out and changing hearts and changing lives. But Lord, you have shown us through your prophet Jonah, you have shown us time and again through Scripture how your word is powerful how it is not weak, and how it has the power to change hearts and lives. Lord, send us forth with this word of healing. Send us forth as people who have been healed, people who have been made right, people who were set for destruction but have now been made holy by the blood of your Son, Jesus. Lord, send us forth that we may proclaim that healing and that we may see just how powerful you are. May we never doubt. May we never distrust, but may we always know with full confidence May we know the totality of your love, that it stretches even beyond our weak hearts to the very broken, to the destroyed in this world and this, in our lives. Lord, we pray that your peace would be upon us and that your peace would dwell with us and that as we go forth, that this would may be our message, a message of repentance, a message of healing, a message that brings peace. And so we pray in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen.